Amen. God bless you, beloved church. Welcome back to our study through the book of Ephesians. Today we find ourselves in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 20. So we have quite a few uh, verses to work through here. So let's read it in its entirety. Let's pray. And then we're going to break them down into bigger sections at a time and just ask the Lord to speak to us. Amen. Verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse gesturing, jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, do not practice, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is a disgrace even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things belong visible. All things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand that the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine. For that leads to dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father, and to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you and we thank you for this opportunity to gather, to glorify your name to speak about your word and we pray now that you would speak to our hearts in faith reveal your truth to us O oh god and give us the courage to walk out that which you reveal to us today by the power and the anointing of your holy spirit for the glory of god we ask in your name amen okay so here we see paul is going to continue teaching what the new life looks like Ephesians 5 1 and 2 therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma Paul here reminds us who we are to imitate God himself Jesus left us countless stories and examples of what it looks like to walk in love and in righteousness. And in the same way he gave up his life as a ransom for many, we are to give up our lives as a spiritual sacrifice for many others, that we offer it unto the Lord for the evangelism of lost souls and for the discipleship of his beloved saints, that they may attain a level of maturity and unity in the body of Christ. That's why he says in verses 3 through 5, but immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you. Think about the weight of that statement, immorality, impurity, and or greed must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints, and there must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which simply means joking, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God in Christ. So now Paul here is getting very specific. He says whether you're among believers or non-believers, there needs to be an evidence that you have a possession of this faith in Jesus Christ through a transformed life in such a way 
that no one can pin you to immoral living, impure living, or greed, that it can't even be named among you in seriousness that you do not attain or have any of those qualities. Paul here shows in verse 4 that it shouldn't even be in your speech the way you joke, the way you talk amongst one another. We have to understand that the culture at the time of this writing normalized coarse joking. Um, it was written by a historian that sexual hu sexual humor was often portrayed in plays and even in mimes that as you would walk through the city, you would see mimes acting out provocative things in the plays, in the theater work, you would see sexuality and sexual jokes. And so there was a normalization in the culture and society in which Paul is writing. The ancient people of this time would know exactly what Paul was getting at, even the entertainment and the things that we engage in in our culture and are normalized today. They pull out that old man, that old way of talking and doing and dealing with things. And so Paul here is getting right to the point. He's cutting right to the heart. This is why it's important that we're transformed by the renewal of our minds as we spoke about last week and we're walking out in the evidence of the faith because Paul says no one who is immoral, no one who is greedy, no one who is covetous, no one who is impure is going to inherit the kingdom of God. And so there's this strong walk that God is calling us to. But even in our speech, even in our joking, even in the things we say, it is speaking to what's in our heart. Jesus says in Luke 6, 45, The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks what the heart is full of. See, the way we speak, the way we joke, the way we carry ourselves is in relation to what's stored in the heart, either being renewed or being old, being that old man. And Paul here closes this thought by reminding us that no immoral, impure, covetous man or idolater will enter the kingdom of God. That's why he says it shall not be named among you any of those characteristics because you are now children of God above reproach standing in the strength and the arm of the Lord. He continues on in verse 6 through 10, and he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Paul immediately follows this thought up with don't be deceived by empty words because he knew clear well that there was a perversion of the gospel amongst false teachers of this day. This would be the type of false teachers that were highlighted in our study through the epistle of Jude where Jude says that these teachers were perverting the grace of God to become a license to sin. Paul says, let no one deceive you. This is the pure and true transforming gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul reminds us not to be partakers with them, but to stand in the purity and the truthfulness of the gospel. This is such a hardship to talk about and to think about because I myself know people and have uh, friends that went from sitting under a pure and sound doctrine and teaching and they've departed from that and they've gone to deceptive teachers who have condoned their lifestyle of sin and brokenness and perpetuated the cycle of bondage in their life. Yet in their minds, they're fully convinced that they're sitting under the same gospel. They're fully convinced that they're walking in purity and truth when in reality, they're walking in deception and darkness. And so this is, it's very important that we don't get caught up listening to voices that are justifying the sin and the behavior in our life that's contrary to what God has called us to. And he says here, don't even be partakers with those. Don't associate with those who are living in this way. 
we have to define that a little further because we can bring that to the wrong application if we're not careful. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, and 12 says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person or covetous or idolater or reveler or drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what I have to do with judging outsiders, do you not judge those who are within the church? Here Paul's making a distinction that we should not associate with those who claim to be in Christ but have given themselves over to worldliness. That's not someone we associate with. We should associate with those who are not in Christ, not claiming to be in Christ, who are fully given over to the world with the hope of evangelizing and sharing the gospel so that they might be saved and receive God. And so our goal here, therefore, is to win people over into the kingdom of God through a relationship with them and a proclamation of the gospel, but being careful not to associate with those who are claiming to know Christ but have given themselves over to the pleasures of this world. It's a very, uh, very scary place to be, and it's a bad friendship to have, and it will lead you and can lead you to compromise in many different areas, not just in the way in the areas where those people are struggling. Verses 11 through 17. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's a disgrace even to speak of things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they're exposed by light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So again, don't participate in the acts of the flesh. Instead, expose them for what they are. I once heard a great man of God say, when it comes to our actions, we will either judge them or justify them. This is indeed what Paul is getting at. We will either judge the deed, the joking, the action, the motive, that we might purify it, or we will justify it, that we might be righteous in our own eyes. In the process of renewing the mind, Jesus Christ will shine a light in the dark places of our life. If we allow him to, he will expose them, he will purify them, and he will free us from our affections and attention to them. Verse 15 and 17 in those verses we just read emphasize our call to be wise with how we live. And this comes down to making the most of our time. It's so important that when we consider our calling, we live in one of the most fast-paced, time-consuming, time-wasting cultures that has ever been or ever will be. And so optimizing our time has to do with walking in purity. For when our minds are renewed and we're walking in this purity, the Spirit will lead us through conviction and confirmation of how to spend our time. And in Christ, we will be able to effectively steward work, family, school, community, friendship, church life, and many other categories that we're called to engage in to be a well-rounded believer. This comes through the transformation and submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ that he will allow us and enable us to make the most and the best and most effective use of our time to the glory of God and to the benefit of ourselves and our family in Christ Jesus. And it's interesting he brings this up in verse 18. He says, Don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making a melody with your heart to the Lord and always giving thanks for all things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. 
You would almost assume that Paul would put this drunkenness in with the list of other immoralities, but he separates it and he contrasts being drunk with the Spirit with or being drunk with wine with being filled with the Spirit. I apologize for the wrong wording there. I want us to focus on that verse 18 for a moment, but we can't understand it in its fullness without verses 19 through 21, which contrast it. So we have to make the contrast between drunkenness and the spirit-filled life. You cannot have both. It is one or the other. And in this culture uh, that Paul is writing to, drunkenness was associated with the loss of self-control. Uh, but there's a much deeper meaning than losing physical self-control. When we give ourselves over to alcohol, we spiritually give up. Control. See, in the culture that Paul is writing to, there were banquets for the rich, there were taverns for the poor, but all of those gatherings, whether rich or poor, were built on two substances, alcohol and sexual immorality. Those were the two sinful behaviors that were prevalent at these parties. It was believed by the people in Ephesus that the Greek goddess was the god of wine. And it was believed that through drunkenness, this God would possess an individual literally and that the drunkenness would provoke a presence within you that would lead you to sexual immorality. So when Paul says to ancient Ephesus and ancient Ephesian people, don't be filled or drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, they knew exactly, precisely what he was talking about. Historians write about the taverns of this day, where downstairs in these taverns there was food, there was an eatery, a restaurant, and there was a bar, and upstairs was a brothel with prostitutes, where at the end of a night of drinking, the men would go upstairs, and they would engage in sexual immorality, and they would pay the women uh, for this service. See, there was a, a, a whole reality going on that was connected to alcoholism. And this is a side conversation for another day. This lesson is not about alcohol. But Paul is uh, making a strong point here. He's saying that drunkenness, and for all practical reasons, let's say being under the influence of outside substances, whatever they are, whether that be marijuana, whether that be pills, whatever it is, it leads us to a place of invoking the influence of other spirits, which will most definitely manifest itself, if that's the case, in immorality, and in most cases, sexual immorality. So now, Paul is contrasting being drunk, leading to immorality, with being filled with the spirit, which leads to morality, which leads to what he says in the rest of the verse, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making a melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This is beautiful. The fullness and the fruitfulness of our gatherings. I don't know if he made the connection yet is dependent upon the believers not being dependent upon who's preaching, who's leading worship. It's not being dependent on a consumeristic service that is driven to appease people. But the fruitfulness of our gatherings as believers, whether in a small group or a large group, is in direct proportion to the majority of the individuals who are gathering are being filled with the Spirit throughout the week so that when they come to the gathering, they're not looking for a pick-me-up. They're not looking for a, a, you know, a, a hoorah party where they get all you know, excited, emotionally driven to serve the Lord, but they're actually coming with an overflow of being in the Spirit so that when they gather, there's genuine worship of Christ taking place. There's a mutual edification. There's a submission to one another. There's a submission to leadership. And it is creating an atmosphere that is real and vibrant and genuine. And beloved, I cannot tell you I cannot emphasize enough 
how much this leadership team is looking for a purified, mature body that is living out their faith in such a way that we are attaining this type of togetherness and gathering that is a time of refreshing and a time of joy in the presence of Jesus as we submit to his will, to his way, and to his word. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for the conviction and the challenge your word brings to our hearts. We ask now as always you would give us enough grace and faith to walk out that which you reveal to us by your spirit. Empower us, encourage us today, and we'll give you all the glory, all the honor, and the praise. Now lead these groups in this time of discussion to grow closer to you and receive everything you have for us today. In your name, amen. God bless you.